just to let everybody know, as you just will know now, that we're being recorded. So just keep that in mind. Feel free to use the chat box and we'll be monitoring that. Um, our phone's on silent, our mic's on mute. And if you want a copy of the recording or the slides, just email us and you'll see our emails come up on the way through. Anything else we need to say before we kick off, guys? Otherwise, gents, over to you. Everybody. You will need to up your volume, Janice, again. Oh, I've no idea how to do that, but I will hold it up here. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Social Science Week, everyone. Uh, on B, I'm presenting Henri um, Black, Associate Professor Rosemary Black here in Port Macquarie, and also um, me. Uh, I'm a sessional academic at Port, but I'm also an independent researcher and have been in the not-for-profit space for a while. Um, Monica, were you doing an introduction or will I just keep going for sake of time? Yeah, do keep going, Janice. Okay. I would also like to acknowledge uh, that I'm presenting on Virapai land, uh, the people of Port Macquarie, and also that the research that I'm presenting on was conducted on Virapai land, so I pay my respects to the elders past and present we can go to the next slide. Do I do that or does somebody do that for me? I think you have to do that, Ro. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. And the next one. All right. Now, the research I'm talking about was um, funded by the Rural and Regional Community Initiate, um, Initiative. Bought by a CSU grant. And I have worked with an organisation called Touch by Olivia, uh, so I, in my, in my experience with Breakthrough People Solutions, disability organisation, I've been with Breakthrough for 20 years and some, some of my research has been with Touch by Olivia, so I know about them, but you probably don't. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of who they are. They're a not-for-profit organisation that was started by John and Justine Perkins after the loss of their little baby, Olivia, at eight months old as a way of working through the indescribable grief of losing a baby, uh, Justine Perkins wanted to give Libby's life meaning. And she, she did that by within six weeks of Libby's death by in creating this charity called Touch by Olivia. So thanks to her little life, um, the lives of other children with disabilities has been improved. The little symbol up here in the corner of the little hands, it's, it's supposed to look like a butterfly of a very small child's hand. And Touched by Olivia's aim is to give hope and pleasure into the life of children with disabilities. So they do that primarily by developing accessible, inclusive play spaces. So our, our study in 2016 was researching whether the play space in Port Macquarie, they're all called Livy's Place. There are play spaces called Livy's Place all over Australia. There's about 30 of them. Uh, and they're all locally developed in consultation with council and the local community and based on the community needs. So there's not one Livy's Place that is the same as another. They are all unique. Ours in Port Macquarie is at the, at the mouth of the river, just near the ocean, and we've got a nautical theme. So we have mermaids and dolphins and a pirate ship, and it's delicious. I love it. But they have never been assessed as to whether they were really meeting their need of social inclusion. So I contacted Touch by Olivia and said, why don't we apply for the CSU grant and do an evaluative study on our local one in Port Macquarie? So that's what I did asked um, Rosemary if she would like to be part of the fun, and we conducted our study. Now, if you have a look at the, this slide, one of them is, is a big uh, liberty swing at, full of little children at, touch, at our park in, in Port Macquarie. The other one is a pretty typical playground with a, a big slippery dip and a sand base so it's nice and soft. But Justine Perkins realised that if a child is in a wheelchair and comes to the park with the sand base, they are immediately bogged. 
many, many playgrounds are designed without any idea whatsoever about people with disabilities or people with different abilities. And so the, the, the Liddy's Place parks are specifically designed with disability in mind so that they might be an all abilities park and an, an intergenerational park so that it's not just for children but all people in society can access a park and play. How's the sound going? Okay, good. Tell me, jump in if I get too soft. It's, it's still quite soft, so feel free to speak louder if you can. Jane. Okay, all right. So a Libby's Place is designed to be inclusive and accessible so that everyone can play. It's underpinned by principles of universal design. It's community designed and it's collaboratively designed. So next slide, please. So the purpose was to see if they were achieving uh, an inclusive um, society through play. And so why is play important? Well, Touch by Olivia believed that play is a central part of childhood. Not only uh, is it a right but it, and a fundamental social building block, but you'll see on this slide I've got the United Nations symbol because play is articulated explicitly in Article 31 on the Convention of the Rights of the Child as a right of all children. So every child, whether they have a disability or not, has a right to play. And the disability literature would tell us that many children are actually excluded from playgrounds. And there's an implicit message that they are not welcome because there's a ladder to get up the, the slide, which a child in a wheelchair can't use. There might be a tyre swing which a child with certain in physical impairments might not be able to get onto and hold onto. So a lot of the equipment and the setting of, of playgrounds are actually exclusive. But an inclusive society assumes that everyone belongs there. An inclusive play space is somewhere where people of all ages and abilities can play. So that's what we, we set out to look at. Did the people in Port Macquarie consider our play space to be inclusive? Do they feel welcome? Do they feel safe? Uh, there were all sorts of um, questions that we were asking within the mind of, within the concept of an inclusive play space. All right, next slide please. So with the idea that play is a fundamental social building block and it's also a right, it's something which should be fun and it should be shared. So play is supported by people. We can certainly play on our own, but we often play with others. So play is something which offers and encourages play experiences that people uh, can engage with others in. It promotes independence and a sense of mastery and accomplishment. So with the concept of play as a social building block and also something that frequently happens uh, with other people, play spaces need to be uh, need need to be something which facilitate uh, interdependence, that facilitates um, engagement with other people. So, thinking of play as a right, play as a social building block, we used the Australian Early Childhood Learning Framework of being, becoming, and belonging as a principle around which we designed the research. We adapted that framework and designed our, our survey questions all around the sense of belonging to Port Macquarie, becoming a part of Port Macquarie and being a member of the Port Macquarie community. So the idea of belonging, experiencing belonging, we all belong somewhere. We belong to our family, we belong to a culture, we belong to our community. So. Belonging is in, integral to human experience. And belonging is also closely linked to a sense of being and also becoming. So belonging was one of the aspects that underpinned our, our, um, our research questions. Next slide, please. A sense of being recognises the significance of living in the present. It's the here and the now and it's the participating 
in life right this minute rather than planning for the future. And a lot of being happens in a park. Uh, it's a sense of being where the, the little kids are on the plank and they jump off the, the plank into the water where the imaginary sharks might get them and they chase each other like wild things around the park. That's a sense of being. And we were looking to see whether Libby's place encouraged a sense of being. When the little boys climbed up the crow's nest with the pirates in the corner there, uh, were they engaging in a sense of being? Or the little girl riding the dolphin? Or sitting on a rock singing like a mermaid? Were they caught up and uh, given an opportunity to enjoy life in the moment? So that's the sense of being. And becoming, uh, we change all the way through our life. We, from, a, from a baby to a toddler to a school child, we, we are constantly changing and becoming the people we're going to be. So our identity and our knowledge and understanding is constantly changing. We were looking at how do we, how does this park um, encourage a sense of becoming? How does it encourage or reflect the process of who we're all learning to be? Are there learning opportunities, uh, sharing opportunities, learning to be uh, fully participating in society? Does that happen at Libby's Place? So these are ideas of, of Becoming, belonging and being were interwoven into our, our research questions. We conducted a face-to-face -face survey as well as online survey. So questionnaire survey was our yeah. key methodology. And we used closed questions as well as open questions. I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions at the end if you wouldn't mind putting yourself on mute. <laughs> because it's difficult to concentrate with, with other sounds. So uh, Libby's Place, we like it, scale, open-ended questions for some areas, but most of it was um, demographic data. And we conducted our, our survey, the face-to-face -face survey, on two days. First, The first day was market day, and the, there's a picture of market day there in the middle of this slide. It's very, very busy in Port Macquarie. We thought that would maximise participants. Libby's Park is situated right where the market is held. But we also conducted the survey at Town Green Park because we thought that might give us insight into why people perhaps they've visited Libby's once and they don't want to go back. So it, we might have been able to get participants that could give us insight into some of the problems or issues that would make them choose to go to a different park. So two survey sites over two different days, one on a very busy market day and the other one on Wednesday. Because there may be reasons why park users want to go on a quiet midweek day rather than uh, a busy, busy weekend. So that was, that was uh, the first part of the survey. The second was an online survey, if you want to turn, um, turn the slide, please. And the online um, questions were identical to the face-to-face -face survey. But we thought we might maximise our participants um, by having people do the online survey who, who weren't at the park on the day of the survey. So we advertised that online survey through council website, through the library and the local swimming pool and, and school newsletters, social media. There's a, a Libby's Place a Friends Facebook site. So we distributed to that um, database as well. Ah, and we, we ended up getting similar numbers on the online survey, 97 participants for the online survey and 96 for the face-to-face. -face. So that was, that, was, that was interesting in itself that they were so even. And for a, for a limited budget, 193 participants was pretty good. Um, pretty good response rate. But we understand that this is just a snapshot. It's, we can't generalise uh, this for all users of Libby's Park or even park users in Port Macquarie. But it, it did give us an idea of what the people on the day and the people who can, did the online survey think of our little research project. Next slide, please. So... Uh, the limitations of the study were that it's just a snapshot. 
we understand that it can't be generalised. We we didn't have much money, so that we couldn't do a big study. And we we interviewed people over the age of eighteen. Uh, the perspectives of basically the parents, most of, most of the participants were parents that brought children to the park. But that means we didn't get the view of children. And we didn't get the view of children with disabilities. And that is a target uh, core user group that the, that the parks are made for. So the, this study is one step, but there is room for a much bigger study uh, to find out what children with disabilities think about going to Libby's place. And the, the literature will tell us that not only are children a, a fairly silenced group in, in research, but children with disabilities are, are very silenced. Their, their opinion is not listened to. They are a very disempowered um, population. So that's a project I would love to do, but obviously that takes a lot of time and we didn't have the resources for that. So a little bit of demographic about the beautiful Port Macquarie, and it is just as beautiful as that picture, I can tell you. Port Macquarie has a population of 75,000 people, 75,635. It's a lot of people, 27% of which are people with disability. That's large, that is a large proportion. Uh, nationally, disability studies is my field, that's where my PhD is, and about 20% of the population of Australia have a disability. Well, in Port Macquarie, it's 27. It's a, it's a place for people to retire, and we have a, a, a large um, older age demographic, but we also have young families, and 27%. It's a lot of people with disabilities. Of that um, 27%, 1%, according to the ABS, are children under 12. So 1% of our population um, have disabilities, are kids. Now, what we found was the main user group. This is the launch, uh, the park launch. Isn't that a great photo? <laughs> Beautiful sunny day in Port Macquarie. Uh, the main user group are families with children under 12 and predominantly preschoolers. And we did find that Libby's Place promotes a sense of belonging and of becoming and also of being a valued member of the of Port Macquarie. It was a creative place. It was a place that children can use their imagination and, or play on their own. There are quiet spaces. There are musical spaces. It, it's, uh, it's quite a lovely place. But we also found, even though only 1% of our um, disabled population are children, 9% of our respondents had children with disability. So that led us to think, well, that's fantastic. Children with disability are actually overrepresented in Libby's Park. So it is achieving its goal and people are coming. That's, uh, that's fantastic. That was really exciting news. But we asked for areas of improvement. So we, we decided that they were meeting their goals of social inclusion, not only by the fact that lots of children with disabilities are coming to the park, but also because of friendships that were made and uh, conversations between parents that were started and the way the park is used or the Libby's play space is used for families to engage in birthday parties or play groups, all sorts of ways it's used. It's, it's terrific. But we asked how could it be improved? And that slide there in front of you gives you an idea it's sunny here in Port Macquarie. We, we don't get much bad weather. And this was a park with basically no shade. There are some trees, but because it was a new park, there were a lot of little seedlings and not a lot of shade. So how can it be improved? 106 people told us, more shade, please. You know, it's, it's lovely to go to the park, but I'm not coming if it's too sunny. And really, it, that's a... It's a health and safety thing. You don't want to play in an Australian playground if there isn't any shade. So that was a really valuable suggestion that we could put forward to council. If you'd like to go to the next slide, please, Rowena. So uh, toilets were another really important factor. And there are public toilets across the Oval. Uh, it's a decent walk when you've got a two-year-old. 
um, near, near Libby's Park and they said, no, we want a change area, particularly a baby change area and accessible toilets right here in the park. It's no point in taking three little children to a park and then have to lug them right the way across an oval to get to the really yucky public toilets, gross public toilets, no baby change table, dirty concrete floor, gross. So that was a really important um, feedback too because part of an accessible place is making it a comfortable place. And there is not a lot of point in putting tens of thousands of dollars into a lovely play space that people won't use because it's too hot and there's got gross toilets. You know, it's a waste of money. So toilets, we had uh, 32 people raise the issue of comfortable, accessible toilets. Play equipment that was suited to older children was another point that 28 people mentioned. This park really suits preschoolers. Everything is uh, smooth, a uh, smooth, um, I don't know what you call that. Uh, it's, it looks like tar, but it's sort of spongy. It's all smooth, so the people in a wheelchair or children on scooters or Nana with her Zimmer frame can easily move around the park. There's a, a a, a ramp, walking ramp up to the slide so you don't have to climb a ladder. But there are climbing frames there for um, more able children. But they thought this, the, there wasn't enough play equipment for older children. So don't design a park that's only for preschoolers because a lot of mums with preschoolers have also got eight-year-olds and 12-year-olds. You want a park that's intergenerational so it should have lots of different play equipment. So we've got good suggestions on what they, that might look like. People wanted different types of swings, not just the big um, liberty swing that you could lie someone on, but also baby swings and toddler swings and swings that you could actually wheel a wheelchair onto and clip on. Now that's a very expensive piece of equipment, but it's something worth putting to council because it might be if 9% of our park users have a disability, it might be something that gets used and is worth the money. So more benches, more play equipment, and um, a self-closing gate. All Libby's parks are fenced, and they all have self-closing gates, but ours in Port Macquarie has three gates, and you just need some helpful person to leave it ajar, even wedged with a rock, so they can bring the picnic baskets in and out, and you'll lose a two-year-old in no, no time at all. If any of you are, are parents, you know that little kids are quick. So... Uh, there were lots of suggestions for improvement. This was my favourite photo of all of the many photos that we took of the park. It's a it's a wet play area too, so it's just delicious. But our findings indicated that Libby's Place was meeting its principles and values of being, belonging and becoming. And I think this little picture here... Uh, just captures little children living in the moment and it was meeting its goal of social inclusion but there's room for improvement. So based on the views of our adult um, park users and using that frame of being, becoming and belonging, our study found that children with and without disabilities had a sense of belonging to Port Macquarie. They looked forward to going there and they enjoyed being there. They were able to be themselves and engage in creative and imaginary play. They enjoyed the moment and it gave them an enhanced sense of well-being. So I think that demonstrates that the model that Touch by Olivia use uh, in creating their play spaces, which is also underpinned by universal design and, social and community consultation, does result in a socially inclusive play space that's appreciated by the community. So there you are, everybody. I don't know whether I've gone on too long. Is there time for questions? Absolutely time for a couple of questions, Janice. Lovely. There's a comment in our chat box um, about inclusion also being relevant when we think about equality and equity. Yes, it is, it is essential and 
And as Justine Perkins found, unless you are within the world of disability, you have a, a child with a disability or a relative with a disability, you simply aren't aware of how privileged the able-bodied community is and how, how the, whole, the whole society is developed by people who are able-bodied and for people who are able-bodied. So that's just not on. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's sort of a, a paradigm shift when you look at the world from the perspective of people with disabilities and you realise that inclusion, it's more than just the built environment. It's the whole perspective uh, that people develop um, these sort of playgrounds. It, it has to underpin the whole uh, design concept. Any other questions? Did you know the playground in Bathurst is that there's a playground in Bathurst that's ranked the most accessible in New South Wales, Janice? No, I didn't, but I wonder if... a comment from Richard. Oh. That's great, Richard. And these Libby's places are everywhere, which is fantastic. Uh, and our little study here in Port Macquarie was the first time any of them had been assessed. So good on CSU, I, I reckon. They have done a bigger assessment since then, but ours was the first, so I was too chuffed for that. Okay. Thanks so much for that, Janice. I think that clearly covers our um, overarching themes of how social science is represented in our daily lives and the, our value of inclusion. Now, sorry, guys, I didn't show you Janice's um, references earlier. But you can see Janice's email on the bottom of the screen there. So please feel free to contact her for slides or any further information. And uh, feel free to contact me if you would like um, a copy of the recording. So our next speaker today is, is Dr Sabine Wardle. And continuing to think about the concept of inclusion, her work has been in the area of multicultural care for people who are elderly and moving towards the end of their lives. So I think I'll just put you in the safe hands of Sabine. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Happy Social Science Week. Um, thank you for this opportunity where I can uh, share some of the findings, but more importantly, the um, major theme of this presentation is inclusion. And I'm going to talk about more about um, culturally sensitive uh, palliative care. Uh, and I'm going to share some of the insights uh, that I've found from my recent study uh, on um, culturally sensitive palliative care for um, older people uh, and their experience with residential aged care facilities in regional locations. So uh, first of all, I would uh, like to say that when we talk about inclusion, we also uh, think about human rights uh, of being safe and being uh, included uh, in our rights to uh, health, education, uh, and this is one example that I uh, found out from through my research. That was not the original aim to find any link with human rights, but as social worker, I uh, analyzed the situation and I found strong links um, between the findings and how it's challenging the concept of human rights. Now, first of all, when we talk about human rights, uh, we want to make sure that people are aware of whether they are uh, aware of their rights uh, about health and education and um, sustainability around that. But we notice in many fields that uh, people are generally not even aware uh, about their basic human rights. If we go from a global perspective, we are quite privileged in, in Western countries where we often talk about human rights, but there are other countries where these things are not uh, often talked about. So uh, I looked at that situation, and first of all, my um, 
I would like to share that the, my initial uh, point of uh, critical thinking was uh, because of my mother who uh, moved to Australia about uh, about uh, eight years ago. And uh, as she is growing older, I'm realizing that her uh, needs are uh, getting more uh, towards where she needs appropriate care. And I'm looking at the situation and thinking, what if she needs to go in that end-of-life care phase, whether she would get what she uh, needs to get as her basic human rights or not? Um, so that made me think that this situation needs to be looked at. And first of all, I looked at the concept of palliative care. Um, we are well, quite, again, very privileged in Western Western world that we are hearing this term uh, and we talk about this term, but there are different cultures and even I found out in even in a layperson's language, palliative care, uh, the term is very confusing and not many people are familiar with it. So palliative care has an image problem also and a lot of people get confused between palliative care and end-of-life care, whereas there are quite uh, different connotations attached to these two different terms. Um, according to uh, the World Health Organization, palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life. So the focus is on quality of life of patients and their families uh, facing problems associated with life t uh, life-threatening illnesses uh, through prevention, relief of suffering, uh, early identification, and so very broad uh, definition. Although it's not a perfect definition, I have to say there is a lot of debate going on around this definition also. Uh, but it tries to cover the physical, the psychosocial and spiritual elements, whereas uh, end-of-life care is more, um, has more a negative connotation. And if we try and put it in a bracket, what end-of-life care is, we try and separate it with palliative care, which um, means a care provided 12 months prior to death in contrast to palliative care, which is typically care specifically tailored to assist with the effects of life-limiting illness. So as you can see, that there are, there are quite a bit of overlap, but also there's a lot of confusion even for a person reading definitions. So the result is that that very phrase palliative care has become a frightening concept to many people with critical illnesses and their families. Uh, wrongly raising the idea that they are being sent to specialists who will help them die. There's a lot of confusion between, again, palliative care and euthanasia, and, and the debate continues on that topic. Uh, so now growing moment is advocating to rename palliative care so that patients and doctors won't fear using it. So that was the first confusion that I found in the in the field of uh, end of life care or palliative care. That there's a lot of confusion, even for a lay person, let alone if we are talking about a person coming from a different culture, speaks different language, uh, comes from a different um, uh, religious background, where um, the culturally the term does not even exist. So, and that brings a challenge for um, for the basic concept of human right. Now, there's another question whether if palliative care is a human right. That's another debatable question. Some people are very confused about this. And again, I would like to emphasize that people from different cultural backgrounds, they are not familiar with the term, but let alone having to know that, that it can be a human right for them. So, but it is a uh, human right. Uh, one of the human rights is right to health, and as a part of right to health is palliative care, which is a fundamental to health and human dignity. But a lot of people get confused in that concept as well, that, you know, when we talk about right to health, we are talking about people who are uh, currently alive and we want to produce that quality of health to people who are living, not at death or even after dying, whereas palliative care applies to uh, human beings even after one's death because palliative care has to do with, uh, with the families and their well-being after one person passes away. So it goes beyond uh, just the limiting nature of um, uh, de death and dying or even person-centered care because uh, person-centered care 
also in many cultures and for many people, it goes beyond just one person. And the definition of what the, that person is, who that person is, is also uh, under a debate that whether we consider in Western world that we consider a person as one individual or whether we consider a person as a whole family uh, who make joint decisions about living and in dying also. They stand together. So, um, that, so that justifies that palliative care is a human right. Next, uh, next slide, uh, please. So then I, when I was in the process of uh, undertaking this research, I was asked many times that, you know, palliative care is generally considered very uh, medicalized care. And as a social worker, what am I doing there uh, looking at palliative care? And um, it's general perception again is around that palliative care is uh, managed by doctors, nurses, and going through really a bio uh, medical model, whereas uh, social workers are more concerned about psychosocial aspects of uh, one's life. So I was asked this question that, you know, uh, uh, you know, what you, what are you doing in the aged care industry looking at these concepts that whether palliative care is being translated into practice as, uh, as it's defined in uh, WHO's uh, definition as cons what's considered as a gold standard of uh, palliative care definition. So in that sense, as a social worker, I think I am in a, in, in a very good space to uh, look at these kind of situations. And many social workers like myself uh, are practicing in this field. But again, as lay person or people from various cultures, they first of all don't understand uh, what social workers do and what are they doing in palliative care and what palliative care is. So it's all very confusing, which made me look into it a bit deeper, that what are the perceptions? What's the attitude of uh, people from different cultural backgrounds? So what am I doing here? Uh, as a social worker, I, uh, I value human rights. Uh, as a social worker, I uh, want to give voice to people who are vulnerable or who can't say what they want to say or have their say in the process of policy making. Um, and as a social worker, I feel responsible that we need to address these health disparities across life span, whether it's a birth or before birth, death or after death, uh, and looking after people even after one passes away and looking after their families and taking care of their, their well-being, not just one person. As a social worker, I feel responsible that uh, that it needs to be uh, heard that the concept of social justice that goes uh, with human rights in the field of palliative care that needs to be uh, um, be, uh, be shared with other people. And as a social worker, I feel that I am very uniquely qualified and positioned to work and look into these uh, very delicate, sensitive aspects of one's psychosocial uh, well-being. So therefore, that's the justification why I looked at these kind of concepts. <clears throat> so as a result of those um, uh, triggers and these motivations that I had, I worked in aged care industry as part of my uh, work experience in the, in the um, initial years of my career. All these came together to make my decision that I want to look into these uh, things further. Uh, and I was in a very privileged situation where I had the opportunity to do some research. And uh, I was... Uh, again, privileged to uh, have uh, located in the Riverina region where there's a particular uh, group of uh, population from culturally, linguistically diverse background, which is the Punjabi Indians, um, who are rapidly, rapidly growing in Australia, but also uh, increasingly so in the Riverina region. Uh, and that's the number of uh, people overall that have uh, from Punjabi Indian background that have grown in the Riverina region in the last five years is, is at a very um, a rapid rate, which made me think uh, that whether 
uh, this uh, particular group needs to look at whether their uh, end-of-life care needs are being met as a, as a case study. Of course, uh, that the findings of this study will uh, obviously will um, prompt us to look at other uh, culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds, but I'm using this as a case study of Punjabi Indians who are uh, originally from uh, northwest of India and have moved to the Riverina, group, Riverina region for various reasons, whether the, the older uh, population has moved with their uh, children who migrated to the Riverina region for various reasons, whether immigration policies impact that, the education needs, uh, the health needs, and various other factors prompted them to move to the Riverina region. So I started looking at that, and um, I uh, particularly was interested in those uh, people who've had uh, uh, experiences with with uh, residential aged care facilities in in this region, uh, which was very hard to access that kind of sample. So I ended up having very small sample, which might be considered as a limitation, but I call it as a strength. Uh, and I'll talk that, about that in a minute. But before that, what I wanted to look at um, was that what are the palliative care needs of this particular group uh, and their families, considering they are regional, they are in. Uh, regional location, not saying that those issues might not be uh, also valid to uh, the metropolitan locations, but geographical location uh, contributes um, to the complexity of, uh, of the issues that we are all aware of. Uh, so uh, particularly in this region, and what are their needs uh, with uh, cultural, religious, spiritual needs, and how are they experiencing uh, their uh, needs how are they being met according to what WHO says that it should be met in regardless of uh, cultural background or geographical location or whether it's uh, equity based uh, and needs are being met particularly for older uh, Australians, uh, older um, uh, uh, participants. So um, uh, it was a bit of challenge, and I won't go into that detail that how that recruitment process happened. It took me about 12 months to recruit uh, the participants, particularly considering uh, there was a language barrier in terms of advertising. Uh, not that I had a personal language barrier, but in advertising and how to approach those people, and how to let them talk about the sensitive topic of end of life and why would they share it with me. So all these things uh, were very crucial uh, to me um, in terms of in, in the process of recruitment. But after 12 months and using different strategies, um, that I managed to get a very small sample. I managed to get uh, 16 participants from uh, across six families of Punjabi Indians who've had the experience of uh, receiving um, services from residential aged care facilities. Whether they decided to stay in that aged care facility or not, that's a different question. Um, but they, at one point or the other, they did receive the uh, services uh, because of their high needs um, at the, uh, at, due to end-of-life care needs, they needed to go to the residential aged care facilities. So the, the participants who uh, were interviewed, uh, the 10 participants were the children of older persons um, in or out of residential aged care facilities, and six were the older persons who, who have had the experiences uh, getting palliative care services at residential aged care facilities. So the age range was between 35 to 74, considering there were children uh, of the older persons involved in, um, in uh, sharing the experiences. So, and Punjabi Indians uh, is a very unique group that uh, formed with Hindus and Sikhs. So there were some uh, participants who were uh, from Sikh background and some were from Hindus. That made a very good, uh, rich experience from cultural perspective. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the experiences, um, with residential aged care facilities and getting end of life care services. Although they were receiving or they had received uh, the services, they were actually not aware of the term palliative care as I initially talked about. The term palliative care was very strange and very new to them. 
and they were saying, no, I haven't heard of palliative care. This is the first time I'm listening, uh, I'm hearing from you. What is it? So I was not there to uh, uh, give a lecture on what palliative care is, but my aim was to find out what they know about palliative care. So that raises in itself a question about human rights, that if palliative care is a human, one of the human rights, then these people are actually not even aware of the term, which is very Western uh, concept. And people coming from different countries, uh, perhaps it some, makes us think that whether uh, it needs to be, re, it needs rethinking that how we say palliative care. So this participants were saying, I haven't heard, I have heard of the word, word palliative care, but can you explain it for me? Or we don't have such thing that you, it just introduced me to, or we don't have this getting uh, care from a third party at the end of life care, that's not acceptable for us. Um, and the, even the concept of getting care from a third party is just very disturbing. Uh, it should be a family business. And that that's a concern in itself, um, uh, in terms of if we look at the human rights uh, perspective, that what's happening, what we say in theory, uh, in definitions, whether it's being translated uh, across um, different cultures or not. Next slide, Ro, please. And on top of that, they were, while sharing their experiences, they uh, they raised concern about their unmet psychosocial needs and spiritual needs at the end of life care, especially being in regional locations. Um, the food was one of the main thing that major themes uh, that came kept coming up, because. Um, food was, had a strong link uh, with their spirituality and having uh, certain foods or consuming certain foods at end of life uh, were quite uh, disturbing for them and had some uh, spiritual and religious consequences. But what they ended up getting in res residential aged care facility was uh, the confusion around the word vegetarian, which they wanted, and whether they are vegetarian, what's vegetarian, what's vegan. There was a lot of confusion between the staff and the, and, and the participants that what they expected would be would automatically be understood. Then there was a concern about community-based places of worship, which are very important for grieve, grieving, uh, community gathering, for bereavement, getting uh, uh, services from priests, uh, getting end-of-life rituals done. That was not uh, available to the participants, and they really, really struggled uh, having to travel at least two and a half hours, for example, from Boga to Griffith was the minimum distance that they had to uh, cover to get their spiritual needs addressed and at a sensitive and very difficult time of end of life. And then there were, uh, which we hear quite often, but about language barriers at end of life care, at an end of life state, it becomes more crucial because people don't have capacity or uh, that ability to express themselves at their most vulnerable time of their life. And and one participant was saying, when I go to the nursing home, I'm unable to communicate with nurses and doctors there. So I'll have a nurse, but what's the use of that nurse if I can't say what I want to say and she doesn't understand or he doesn't understand what I am saying? Then there were emotional impacts of being in regional location and uh, having uh, coming from a different cultural backgrounds that they couldn't express their cultural needs and the financial impact of going to access uh, basic regional uh, r religious or spiritual needs met or basic um, needs of food of uh, which is appropriate and end of life care for them uh, there are financial consequ consequences which are uh, some which are very hard being in regional location and uh, you know the families and the carers were uh, trying to manage their own finances trying to keep working and here they have extra responsibility of an older person um, whether the crucial decision of whether to send them to a residential aged care facility or keep them at home and how to maintain that balance uh, without uh, being out of pocket so these are some of the um, uh, the uh, quotes that I have 
have um, shared with you uh, from the participants coming directly from them. Um, the bottom line here is that there are multiple impacts of end-of-life care um, that are being experienced by people from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds and just by using one case study I'm trying to highlight that there is a, a, a there's more need of more uh, inclusion in terms of end-of-life care or palliative care uh, purposes at the end stage of one's life. Next slide, Rob, <coughs> please. So ultimately, uh, the findings of this uh, study, uh, although I um, used one uh, particular sample of one particular uh, burgeoning community, uh, but it echoes the need for culturally appropriate palliative care in regional locations, uh, particularly in aged care facilities the need to raise awareness about um, what palliative care is in various languages to target the culturally linguistically diverse population groups, uh, regardless whether they are in regional location or not, but just regional is one, as one critical aspect that complicates the matter further. Provision of religious and spiritual resources are required at this last stage of life for various minority groups and make it more inclusive rather than just focusing on dominant uh, religions or cultural groups. And need for uh, skilled human resources like trained staff, translators and interpreters uh, to uh, combat the barrier of language uh, and in particularly skilled uh, for end of life or palliative care needs and need of serious efforts to uh, restructure the regulatory system to recreate models uh, which are appropriate for uh, culturally linguistically diverse population. I think this all needs rethinking. Um, so I just wanted to highlight this uh, and sharing these experiences um, uh, from human rights perspective and what we might be able to do in the future. I'm still working on this uh, uh, bigger projects and, and trying to make it um, advocate on behalf of various vulnerable groups and hopefully um, with my constant <laughs> efforts and with other networks and other professionals um, I might be able to put that out uh, in, in public uh, and, and raise that awareness in, in terms of uh, making public policy, health policy more inclusive of different cultures. Thank you. Thanks, Sabine. Um, does anyone have, well, there are a couple of questions actually that have come through the um, chat board. Sabine, one thing you touched on, you might be able to expand on, is care for families after someone has died. Mm -hmm. And look, palliative care, how it's defined uh, by World Health Organization, um, that, that palliative care does not end with the person uh, under care and dying because the consequences and the impact of that death uh, are lived by the family members. And palliative care is... Uh, the aim of palliative care is to extend that care uh, onto uh, towards the family members also, not just the one person who was under care. And that's where the difference is. I think people, um, the, the perception and the understanding of palliative care is very, very confusing. And even the definition by WHO does not cover quite clearly that what it entails for the family members afterwards, whether they are uh, still, they can still access care and who's going to tell them that they can access care, whereas the aim ultimately is to extend that care for the families um, uh, to make sure they're okay if one of the family members passes away. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, thank you, Sabine. I just had to unmute myself. Another question here is about end-of-life care in the home and its potential of increasing social networks and community capacity. Have you got any thoughts about community-centred approach to care and dying as opposed to person-centred care? Yeah, and that's one <laughs> aspect of care, whereas... Palliative care is actually aimed at making it more inclusive and including the extended family and also uh, 
uh, you know, facilitating the wishes, uh, the fulfillment of the wishes of the dying person and the families. If they want to um, uh, or choose to die at home, the palliative care can be arranged uh, at the, in their home setting, and that that's a part of that because. What the aim of palliative care is to maintain and uphold the dignity of uh, human life and their choices. Uh, so as a part of a person-centered care, many cultures and and even I think uh, the mainstream uh, Australian uh, families would uh, agree that that the person, when we look at one person, it, it's also their, their connection with the immediate families, their friends, and their wishes, what they want to happen with that person. So it needs to be a more inclusive approach rather than just asking one person or focusing on one person as a part of person-centered care. So what it challenges is the concept of a Western term, um, person-centered care, because person is broader than just one individual. And just following up on that, follow-up question from Kyla is who would introduce that follow-up care in terms of, you know, the service system? Who would be the <laughs> Who introduces it? It generally goes through different systems, um, Yes, but more often what happens is that when, when a person needs um, or identified as needing uh, advanced care, uh, it's identified by a general medical practitioner. And that's the first point. And then general medical practitioner links with, uh, uh, refers a person to community health and community health. And if, as the needs um, advances, then the uh, person can be referred to different uh, disciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach by different disciplines, uh, whether it's at the hospital, whether it's at the community health, or whether it is uh, at their own home, but more often it is um, introduced or actually suggested by the general medical practitioner. It's not introduced, it's mainly suggested, and then it's a person's decision whether to go for it or not, <coughs> or choose to get those services or not. And one last question, Sabine, is um, that's with is a healthcare volunteer with the Murrumbidgee Local Health District, I'm assuming in a sense the Murrumbidgee, and he's um, asking about what are the, some of the ways in which we can better approach towards people from different cultural backgrounds? Uh, look, it's a, it's a, a very broad question. It, it is not a one answer, one sentence answer. I think uh, we need to look at a bro broader holistic approach uh, and look at each individual's needs and their cultural and making sure that they are addressed and asked uh, earlier on. But it needs a broader uh, approach rather than just as saying what can we do better the, what can we do better in a short form I think uh, immediately what we can do is is to allow them to express their needs uh, earlier on and plan for interpreters translators where necessary very early on before even we move into um, you know uh, having that uh, the client or the patient admitted uh, or allowing them to access further services. I think there are very early on steps that we need to be mindful of, which often gets missed. Um, and we are in the busy task focused approach that we all have in our, in our work environments. These little things, which are very big for uh, people needing care, uh, tend to get missed. And we go into this document filling uh, process and documents not always support those columns which are actually important to an individual. I think that's what needs to be looked at and audited and it needs a, uh, you know, um, a broader approach and, and a very collaborative approach from multidisciplinary approach and a policy level approach to make sure that these things are addressed uh, rather than just looking at a form and a black and white, okay, tick, 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 um, tick and flick approach. I think it's, it needs a lot of... Um, uh, uh, it changes, uh, a broader changes in the systems um, before we can even start looking at um, uh, supporting people from culturally linguistically diverse uh, backgrounds. Thank you so much, Shabay. That's been a very thought-provoking um, 
presentation and it certainly makes me think about the whole idea of resettlement being um, much bigger than we um, take account of most of the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our uh, third presentation this afternoon is from the inimitable Monica Shaw, who's going to talk to us through her very specific lens that she'll um, explain to you about bushfire volunteers and people who have been living through the bushfires last summer. Welcome, Monica. Thanks, Ro. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Monica Short. I'm one of the lecturers at Charles Sturt University and a social science researcher. I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm not presenting a research project. I'm going to be presenting some mostly pictures, but an experience uh, and observations that I had early in the year about bushfires. So I'll be using a case study of Anglicare, New South Wales South, New South Wales Western ACT. I, I'd just like to qualify there that there were a lot of people involved with the bushfires, but I'm just going to focus on, on one case study and, and think about the case, the, the whole experience of the Black Summer bushfires from, from the case study. And my aim is to present social work, sociological and theological insights regarding the Black Summer bushfires in Australia and to discuss the essential role of volunteers. When Ro first mentioned to me about let's do something thinking about 2020 vision, and I, I tried to think about at the time what was something that was really what I thought was essential to the well-being of Australia, and, and it kept coming into my mind, volunteers. Volunteers are just wonderful. So what I've got in this presentation is a series of pictures. Ro, if you could go to the next slide, please. So I've got a series of pictures, images that my husband and I saw, saw when we went and visited Anglican churches and Anglican volunteers, Anglicare volunteers in Bega, Cabago, Mogo, Batemans Bay, Batlow and Tumbarumba. And they were very powerful images. So if you look at these pictures, what happened was as we went in, like the, the starkness and the blackness really hit us hard. Um, and I know that many of us here ex either experienced fires or smoke or uh, had someone who was directly impacted by the fires. And, and you listen to the news and they talked about the blackness and the stillness and the, the silence. And what was fascinating was as we were going around, all these signs were popping up. So, for example, you can see the thank you sign there that was just beautifully done. And also jokes started happening. So when we were going past a bookshop near Cabago, that image that you can see there about post oh, I can never say it, apocalyptic fiction has moved to current affairs was in the bookshop window and, and we both had a good chuckle when we saw that. If you go to the next slide, please. So I'll be presenting today from, like I was saying, from a social work, sociological and theological perspective, particularly thinking through thoughts to do with rural social work, rural sociology and rural theology. Social work is the practice-based profession and academic discipline that promotes social change and development, social cohesion and the empowerment and liberation of people. Sociology, according to Giddens, is the scientific study of human social life, groups and societies. And theology is the study of God. Reverend Rob Haynes explains that the Bible and life experiences are vital foundations for theological contemplations. And Christian theology centres on the gospel, which is the story of the birth, life, teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus and explores the world in the light of Jesus. Now, in thinking about these three disciplines, if you see the diagram on the slide, what I'm actually doing is bringing knowledge from the three disciplines and I'm actually focusing on that focal point, the, the point where the three disciplines come together and drawing knowledge out of that focal point. Uh, next slide, please. Right. So just to give some background, I just want to share the stats and facts. And there is some controversy 
about the facts. Um, some people are saying that they're not an accurate presenta representation of what actually happened during the fires. But what I've done is actually quoted the statistics from government websites mostly. So the catastrophic September 2019 to March 2020 black summer bushfires burnt through approximately 19 million hectares, destroyed 5,533 buildings, killed 33 people, including nine firefighters, and one billion animals died. During this time, many thousands of volunteers from non-government and faith-based organisations, such as a range of disaster recovery response teams, volunteer firefighters, the SES, St John's Ambulance, CWAs, Anglicare, St Vincent's de Paul, and the list goes on. Many, many volunteers all mobilised in response, and many of the volunteers were highly trained people. Next slide, please, Roy. In thinking about the calamity that happened through the fires, I started trying to think about it as I was going around and visiting and listening to people's stories. From, from a social work, soci sociology and theology perspective, and from a social work perspective, the word of justice kept coming out and it was shouting at me. So social workers, as Sabine has already so capably explained, they're interested in human rights. And, and Article 3 says everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the security of person. And what happened was I saw constantly different volunteers from Anglicare and also from other organisations going beyond anything that I could imagine possible to ensure that people had that their right to life, liberty and security of personhood was, was absolutely upheld. And it was really powerful to actually turn up at the different places. I'll just back a second, please, row to the previous slide and, and see so many donations coming in and then lots of people being there dispensing those donations. The issue of, though, with justice was making sure that things didn't make it just to the towns where it was easy for people to access. For example... Things would go to where the road would, you know, the, the major roads would end. But how do you actually get them from where they're left to the small communities all around? And this is where volunteers were outstanding. They knew the back roads. So if a road was burnt out, they knew how to get around that to get the stuff out to people who need it. Uh, next slide, please. All right. From a sociology perspective... I really started noticing how people were starting to come together and the real sociality behind what was happening. And this was one of the images that really stood out to me. So this was the Bungendore fridge. It was on the Bungendore Road. Claire and Scott Hooper actually put the fridge out there so that people who were volunteering as well as people who were professionals could stop and get a drink or an ice block. And it was a really powerful thing to drive past. What happened was there were, communication was breaking down, transport networks were breaking down during the fires. So people couldn't get easily get messages to the people who were out volunteering or working out amongst the fires. But the fridge on the, on the roadside actually became a form of communication and bringing people together, a form of social interaction. And it was just beautiful. All these messages started coming up and you could get the sense that it was really, really welcomed what they did. It was so innovative. Uh, next slide, please. So the volunteers were telling me how at times they had no phone, no internet, no petrol, no news, roads were closed, their house was about to burn down. And yet they recognised that they had to get out and help people. So they turned up to emergency activation centres and started talking people and starting to share hope. And that got me wondering about what was going on from a theological perspective. 
Life and hope are recurrent themes within theology. For example, Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And what hit me as I was sitting there and thinking about that was how theological themes really contrasted with what I was seeing around me. So when I was having a look around, what I was seeing was chopped down trees or burnt trees, silence, blackness, loss. And yes, there was a real material impact, such as the loss of assets and fences. And the fires also had a sociological impact, such as the breaking down of relationships so people couldn't actually get near each other and help each other. But there was also a spiritual impact coming on. I was talking to someone um, at an event, a public event, and she said that she's always realised that she had material needs, but the fires changed things for her. She said she was hurting spiritually. So what was happening was this kind of bleakness. I felt surrounded by bleakness, and it was very heavy. And then I watched the volunteers, and it was like such a powerful contrast, seeing the volunteers doing the activities that they were doing. And they were so different to the bleakness. They had respect. They brought dignity. They gave life. They brought social connection, compassion, empathy, love, hope. It was just beautiful. And it was really highlighted just how important to me over and over again the power of the volunteer. Much, yeah, a much important part of our Australian life. Thanks, Ro. So in thinking about the case study, and again, like I said, this is just one case study and there's lots of different stories out there. But it's Anglicare New South Wales South, Anglicare New South Wales West and ACT responded amongst many, many services. And they drew upon a pool of 174 volunteers. More than 80% were activated during the Black Summer bushfires. And more specifically, 140 local Anglicare disaster response volunteers were activated as part of the dis- disaster recovery response teams across 45 different emergency activated centres in New South Wales and ACT. Anglican New South Wales South, New South Wales West and ACT received little or no funding for its response to the different communities at the time of need. The response at the time was dependent mostly on donations and fundraising. Three quarters of the volunteers were women, three quarters were aged 55 and over with two volunteers being older than 85. More than half were retired. Approximately half had been volunteering for more than three years. And it was a very, very stressful time. How many, however, many of the volunteers said that they would volunteer again for the next disaster. And I was just moved by that. But also I was moved when I was reading a report recently, the, a preliminary report into Um, the volunteering experience, and that came out quite strongly in the report, the desire to help again. So what I'm really wanting you to do is to not hear my words but to see the images and, and to feel the experience. And then to start to think critically about it and to, and to reflect upon what, what is it that we can take away from these experiences and how can we thank volunteers. So in terms of the critical issue, when I was there, the, the justice, the need for a natural environment that was help, healthy. And what I saw, as you can see in the photos, was a lot of destruction. But in amongst all that destruction was new, new rubbish being dumped. And I was thinking, oh, we need to really think about justice for our environment. Uh, next slide, Ro, please. Ro, can you hear me? Oh, thanks. Great. Another critical issue was the, the justice in accessing shelter, safe shelter, water, food systems, transport and communication. And the volunteers were working really hard to ensure this happened. 
But I kept thinking about how must it feel, for example, to be the child walking into your school and seeing the trees in your playground like that? Or the person walking back to see their farm built down and walking past that road sign? Or the lack of communication because the internet was down and people having to go and look at notice boards to see where the fires are coming? And again, the volunteers were dealing with these issues all the time. Uh, next slide, Ron. And you know what? In amongst all this bleakness, and, um, and it was an affront to, to all my senses and what I was seeing, what I kept thinking about, like, yes, loss, grief, trauma, stories, but faith and hope and love with everywhere I went. The volunteers were just outstanding. And from a social work, sociological and theological perspective, I really want to reinforce that volunteering is an important and beneficial activity. In Australia, we're struggling with the reduction in number of volunteers. People are wanting to volunteer less hours. People um, are wanting to volunteer for shorter times. But we really desperately need our volunteers. They make the most amazing difference. And they can be there longer. They're grassroots. They can be there longer than anybody else can. So when the government services move on, our volunteers are still there helping. Now to end, oh, Ro, can you go back to the slide? I don't know if you can. Click on because I don't want to notice it's a look and if you have a look you can see the life coming back oh. can we go back to the clip the life coming back amongst all this bleakness. It was just powerful to go there and see the trees regenerating. And I felt like that's what volunteers were doing in the amongst going on. They were just like this. They were giving life and speaking life into people's need situations. So to conclude, I just want to say that volunteers are an essential part of Australia. And I want to say thank you to those who volunteer in Australia. And my 2020 vision, both now, this year, for 2020 and onwards, is the role of the volunteer is immensely important and that we need to really value it and uphold it and do everything we can to support volunteers. So to you who are volunteers, thank you. You're my hero. Thanks, Monica. So what have we got in the chat box? Um, there's a comment that about your idea of volunteers giving life, and I think that's beautifully reflected in your idea, Monica, about the new regrowth that comes so soon after the disaster. There's some questions for Monica on that very emotive and beautiful presentation. Feel free to pop your mic on and ask a question at this point. You may just have stunned us all, Monica. It was exactly how I was feeling when I was going around talking. Mm. It was um, it was a very powerful stage of life to watch. If um, if you do have a question comes to mind. Um, in between now and the time we finish, you'll have an opportunity to follow up at the end of the session too. Oh, here we go. This one coming to me. You said you returned to see life. What was the time frame between visits? It would have been only, I'm trying to remember, it would have been a couple of months. It's been a number of times. So it would have been only a couple of months. And then, and then 
even the last time I went back, the growth was even more stark and impressive. But it was so fast. I couldn't believe how fast. Um, and just so beautiful. Like just to see the, the, the blackness had become like the frame of a picture, you know, when you, you've got the outside of a, a beautiful picture and it's got a black frame and inside it is absolute colour and beauty. That, that's what it felt like. It was just so powerful. So the, um, the volunteering was just about as, as beautiful and as quick as the regrowth. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Grace. Thank you for sharing that. And that volunteers are still working on. They haven't stopped. They're still trying to, um, to do something. And there was just so many volunteers out there. Like, you know, you just saw agency after agency, um, truck after truck of fireys. Like it was just overwhelmingly wonderful, um, very very powerful to see so many people just sacrificing so much to help everybody in their communities or the volunteers that were coming in from other communities to help and, and allow volunteers to rest. That was so powerful as well. It was a very big sum, wasn't it? There's that dilemma regarding how we, how we value our volunteers that came into the discussion during the fires and after the fires regarding payment because you can't put a price on, on volunteering and payment seems to actually cheapen the, uh, the effort and the dedication and the love and the support of the community. So that it's, it's quite a dilemma. What are, what are your thoughts around um, how we demonstrate our value of, of volunteers, Monica? Interesting conversation that was happening on, in the news, um, Janice. I, I don't have an answer to it, but I thought it was... I, I, I just felt torn, like it was quite a, an interesting tension that was going on. I wanted to give absolutely everything I could to the volunteers. I could see that many of them were absolutely exhausted. Um, for example, when I was out talking to some of the volunteers, you know, I talked to people in their 70s who'd worked from maybe, you know, they got up, were out there maybe around 630 and worked till like 10 p.m., went to bed and got up and went back the next day. And so I wanted to give them absolutely anything I could. But at the same time, when I was talking to them, I realised there's nothing I could give that was good enough to say thank you. Like, how do you give someone who sacrifice like their own houses are at risk and they sacrifice that much, that many hours to help somebody else? How, how do you repay that? Um, I noticed that a lot of people, there's been a lot of people saying that they didn't feel like they got the word thank you very often. So I just, yeah, started saying thank you to everybody I saw. Thank you. Even strangers, you know, going past, hello, thank you so much type thing. Just because, um, yeah, I just wanted them to know what they did was so important. And I just feel like it gives such hope to the future of Australia what they do. They, they make us a better Australia. Thanks, Monica. All right. Thank you, Monica. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Sabine. Could I well, please now... introduce now? Um, is it okay to introduce now or is, did I interrupt someone? <laughs> Sorry. No, no. I've got to put my mic on. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, could, uh, could I please introduce uh, Rowena Duncombe? Uh, Rowena is a social worker and academic with a special interest in access to health services for people who live with disadvantage. She explored the issues involved further in research in a rural community. And in her presentation, uh, she shares her experience of taking a social science project through to social action outcomes. Thank you, Rowena. All yours. Thank you, Sabine. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, um, the work that I did was done in um, Byron Bay, so it's a rural coastal community. And um, the background to that was that I'd been working in community health in Byron for a long time, and I was concerned about people's access to the community health service as it operated then. 
and that started with an interest in waiting lists and went on to compare two different types of entry systems, we used to call intake systems, and developed this observation that people could be locked out of services by the entry system, which is a bit perverse, isn't it? But it, filled, it fitted with a fellow by the name of um, Tudor Hart, his inverse care law, that the people that need services most are the least likely to receive them. And um, there's also work from the um, World Health Organization that where they in invested, in sorry, investigated services that had been designed for people living with disadvantage and poverty and found that those people basically didn't get the services as much as did people who were from middle class backgrounds. So even when you intended the services for people with disadvantage, they tended to be picked up more, picked up more by middle class people. There's probably some really good reasons for that. Um, people who are middle class have got a lot more resources, a lot less stress, a lot less chaos in their lives. So it probably makes it easier for us to go hunting around for things and to find things and easier for us to get linked into services because we're more likely to know somebody who knows or know someone who has resources or know someone who works in particular areas. So I um, wanted to further this and I had worked with a group of homeless people for quite a long time and um, uh, so therefore I chose to further this exploration by inviting six of these homeless people to work with me um, and that gave me the opportunity too of including people who didn't use health services at all and I think usually when services do evaluations or inquiries into how their work is going they very rarely get the opportunity to talk to people who aren't using the services at all. One thing that was a bit interesting to me was that Homelessness New South Wales found that 75% of people living homeless in New South Wales were in regional or rural communities. I found that really surprising. Um, we do know that homelessness is increasing and also of prison populations and prison populations of homelessness basically come from the same structural disadvantages if you're looking at these sorts of issues as coming from social structural things. So, for example, if you come from a family living in poverty, that poverty tends to lead to stress and unhappiness, um, which tends to mean that you become a little bit less engaged socially as, you become, as your family becomes more stressed, um, tends to cause conflict in the family, can cause substance use, and if it's really severe, it's likely to cause various forms of abuse, even if that's only people yelling at each other within the family when they're distressed and stressed. The worse these situations are, the more likely they are to predispose us to mental health problems, including trauma symptoms. And if anyone's familiar with the work of Professor Sir Michael Marmot, you know that he calls these things the causes of the causes. So that illness, disease, basically stems from these sort of social issues. So that there's a, a challenge for our society if we really want to deal with the worst of our health challenges, that somehow we need to deal with social inequity. Um, and at the moment, it's not something we've really got to grip on. So homelessness itself is also increasing. Um, we've reduced our stock of public housing and our income support system has become more difficult to access and the pay rate has dipped below the poverty level. So we, where we used to pay income support at a rate that enabled people to stay healthy enough to enter the workforce where industry needed extra staff, that's no longer the philosophy. The philosophy now is that we want to give people only the bare amount that it's possible for them to survive on. And the idea there is that it discourages them from being unemployed, which you probably know is um, contested by those people who say that's all very well, but not when there are no jobs. So an issue for people living in rural areas is that there aren't any specialist services. 
which means that everybody gets served the mainstream services. When we want to service people who are living homeless, there's some really specific things that we need to do. Um, and one of those is to do mobile or outreach services, that is to go where the people already are. And a service that I was closely involved with for, for many, many years was a, a food service, and there are plenty of those. And what we did at the food service was I got the community nurse to come along, so she did the wound dressings for us, she brought the um, flu injection every year, um, someone else organised to bring clothes along. Um, what else did we have? We were lucky enough to have a Centrelink man come at one stage and he would help people with their Centrelink access. A legal aid person would help people with their um, court cases. So when you take services to where the people are, you're far more likely to get access to them. Um, unfortunately for... Uh, our little town, the way that homeless services in New South Wales were delivered changed during the period of my project. And so services stopped being provided directly to small towns, to small towns, and instead they went to the business. So that meant some of the direct services we had access to as it comes to our local community. They disappeared to um, the Salvation Army in that particular case, but in general services were sent to regional centres or major providers who provided them from outside the town. And so the emergency relief went to Centrally, I'm sorry, to the Salvation Army and they delivered on a full line from Sydney. So there you see the kind of issues you can get with service entry. If the way to get access to emergency funds is to ring a call centre in Sydney, you have to have a phone. The phone has to be charged. You have to know what that phone number is. So for someone living homeless, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a challenge right there. Then the next set of challenges is the kind of um, details that the call centre needs you to have before they'll go ahead and give you any phones. Um, okay, so setting aside any outreach services that may be operating successfully, which might be access to temporary housing, and that can be in another centre. Um, Part-time case management, social housing and provider outreach, all of those things that can be really helpful. But services will dominantly be provided by mainstream providers, for example, your local hospital, especially your emergency department, GPs, pharmacies, and local charitable organisations, for example, for those emergency funds and food and clothing. So that means that those people ideally need to have some specialist understanding of what to do. So this is a list of the kind of things that specialist services will do. I'm in Brisbane at the moment, on Twitter group today. Um, and there's a couple of services here. One's called MICA, they're a housing service. And another one is the HOT team, which is a homeless health outreach team, a specialist mental health team. And these are the sorts of things those specialist teams do. They locate themselves centrally so they're easily accessible. They do do the outreach. They do walking. So you don't have to have an appointment. You don't have to ring your head. You don't have to remember a time. You don't have to remember a date. You don't have to pay anything. Ideally, a specialist homeless service has a multiple um, multiple services in one place. So you wouldn't just maybe have a health service. You might also have a rep from Centrelink one day a week. But people know they can rock up on Wednesday and contact Centrelink even if they can't get to um, a suburb a fair way away or a town a long way away. Um, because our health system and our housing system, for example, aren't linked to each other at all, then some sort of case management becomes really, really useful. And the other aspect there of that intensive support dot point is that people who've been living homeless, the longer that goes on for, the more disadvantaged they become and I've come to realise that that's in ways that aren't self-evident, that poverty can get to a level beyond what I could have imagined 
where you're not just poor, but you have all of these debts, whether they're from fines or from medications that haven't been paid for or things that you've borrowed from family or a whole range of things that you haven't been able to keep up with. Um, and that goes along with your loss of self-esteem, you've given up on self-care, you've given up on following up on any of your medical or health things. So um, these are the kind of things that specialist services do that don't easily translate into mainstream services, which is pretty much all you've got in a regional area. And that last dot point is about trauma-informed responses. So that goes back to the earlier point about structural disadvantage and how it arises, especially out of poverty, especially out of intergenerational poverty. Um, and if you have people that have been traumatised, living with extreme stress, especially for a long period of time, especially in childhood, unfortunately it doesn't tend to go away. So people tend to live with those symptoms. Um, and the most obvious ones are what we call getting treated, yeah? So something happens, and it may not be a massive thing, but the person may start yelling, they may rapidly withdraw, they may throw things. Worst case scenario, they may become physical, physical abusive to another person. Those sort of symptoms can be quite difficult for people to manage, depending on how much... Um, abuse and damage they've suffered themselves. So, what we find, uh, so, next slide. Um, so what can smaller communities do? One of the things I've been thinking about is the role of the council. One of the factors in Byron is that all of the major services are centred outside the town. So we've got that emergency relief, for example, which is Salvation Army in Sydney. Um, the um, adult emergency accommodation went to a service in Lismore, that's uh, 45 minutes away. The youth house went to a service in Two Heads, um, and they moved the emergency houses to young people to Bellum, which is about 25 minutes away. Um, the health department is based in Two Heads. The housing department is based in Lismore, or well, the contractors who now do that social housing aspect are based in Lismore. Um, the primary health network, who now do the community health type stuff, they're based in Ballina. So there's no one, there's no really major players who actually are looking at our community. The only people looking at our community are our council. And they don't actually carry any of the roles that hit on homelessness. They don't do housing, they don't do that. They don't do any emergency funds, they don't do opportunity shops. So that creates some, um, that creates a bit of a conundrum, I think. We do have community centres and they become very, very important. Um, I think the issue of inclusion becomes really important here. Now, regional communities and rural communities are no different if anywhere else, and so there are people in those communities who are very inclusive, and people in those communities who carry the sort of biases that they're all very familiar with. So the people that I was speaking to in the project would talk about a lot of really unfortunate things that they've experienced, uh, council rangers tearing down their campsite and taking all their belongings so they can get back from going into town to a food centre to get food. They come back and find out everything they've done is gone. That can be one sort of pretty stressful experience that people have. Um, another issue that I want to touch on, so this is what this made me think about, was the concept of volunteer training. If there's no specialist services in town, maybe it would be good if those other services that stay there, the people who are in the community centre, the people that are in the opportunity shops, um, the council ranges, 
the house who had that issue. Um, maybe it would be really useful if those people had some training in the sorts of things that would make them skilled, not only at servicing people who look homeless, but that would cut across into other people who would be significant disadvantage and have potentially trauma systems, symptoms. So think of a pharmacy situation where someone who's got those sort of um, triggers happening comes into a pharmacy, something goes down that upsets them, they throw a bit of a candy, maybe not too much, maybe just abusive language. They distress the shopkeeper, the, you know, the, the, the girl who's helping, the young woman who's helping in the shop. And as a consequence, they then get barred from that pharmacy. So you can see that there can very easily be knock-on effects when people don't understand how to deal with these sorts of things. So I came to think that it might be useful if it were possible to give a degree of training about handling trauma to people who came in contact, mainstream services who come in contact with people. I'd be interested to hear what more we think about. Um, that would include people who um, work for GPs, GP receptions. It would also include people who start the emergency departments. Um, yeah, so quite a lot of situations in which I think volunteers who are well-meaning make judgments based on what would seem to be common sense, like um, a comment that one of the participants mentioned was that someone had had all their stuff taken by the leaders and they were very distressed, went to an opportunity shop to see if they could get some assistance and a remark from the lady on duty that day was, oh, you know, they've got enough money to spend on the job, they don't need any help. So... Um, the problem is, of course, yes, they might spend some money on grog, and that would probably be because they live with a very high level of stress and a little homeless. There is no, especially if you're living on the streets or in shotguns, etc., there's no safety. You're kind of very um, open to predators. So you probably do need some substances to survive in that type of situation. So, yes, they do spend some money maybe on wild or smoking weed, but that doesn't really address the fact that you've just lost everything. So sometimes those common sense responses um, aren't very helpful and show a lack of understanding of the bigger picture as it were. Okay. So just a couple of pics of... Um, the people that I know with. There's one of our community nurse again checking out a room and a couple of the people at the homeless breakfast having a feed and just the guys hanging out um, during the day. And that's it for me. If anyone would like to make any comments or um, ask any questions. Oh, that was fantastic. Very fascinating. So are there any questions for Ro? So Janice has got a comment in the box, Ro, saying councils do have a social inclusion responsibility. Do you want to talk to that at all? Yeah, thank you, Janice. Uh, look, as it turns out, our council have jumped in here and um, one of the participants in my project was the manager of the community centre who also happened to be a councillor. So when we received the feedback about the, um, what was happening with the rangers, he took that back to council and council have actually completely changed the way that rangers approach this now. So what they do now is they give people two weeks warning and in the context of the COVID stuff, which just has had such a big impact, hasn't it? Suddenly, out of nowhere, I forget the new name for the Department of Communities in New South Wales, um, DCS, something like that. They suddenly appeared out of the woodwork and lived around the people living in the streets and made an effort to rehouse them. I have some reservations about that whole subject, but 
What it meant was that when the council next went to clear out a couple of sites in the dunes where they don't want people camping because of um, uh, baby turn settlements, so for ecological reasons, they actually gave them two weeks' warning. They got that department back in again to see if they could actually find housing for people and they didn't strip away their entire worldly belongings. So council have been listening to that, which is just fabulous. So I don't know too much specifically about the council responsibility with inclusion, Janice, but I do know that our council have been responsive, and I think probably about them beginning. Now there's another comment here about the need for multi-service provision. Do you want to comment on that as well, Ray? Yeah, at, at one stage we had a cooperative arrangement between the Salvation Army and St Vincent de Paul, the community centre and the council, because the council had a, a cottage on a property in the middle of town and we were able to use that as a kind of a drop-in centre and the Salvation Army ran it. And that gave us a bit of an opportunity for a multi-centre because the drug and alcohol counsellor would drop in there, etc. So A, it gave them somewhere to go during the day. The Salvation Army staff were able to do some help and support and um, at least the drug and alcohol person went there. So that was good. Now, we did lose that um, because the salvos um, withdrew. But it looks like because of the conversations we've been having, it looks like there's a chance we might get that back. And this time it might be more clearly aimed at being a space where various services could come to access the population of people living homeless. So, look, it won't be a flash urban setting where you've got, you know, I don't know, a lot of people coming in, but it will be somewhere where more than one service can come and where people can get off the street during the day. And that has an advantage too, because it kind of gets the retail sector who are not on side off their backs a bit if there's somewhere for them to be during the day. There's a question here to do with, uh, well, more of a comment actually, to do with New South Wales State Debt Recovery Office charges. Do you want to comment on that at all, right? Um, I'm not sure what that's referring to. I know there's a, a debt recovery project where people who owe money and who have no hope of paying it can do things like volunteer or go to counselling. Probably not the sort of project that would engage the people that, that I know, um, although I do think it's a good project, but that may not be what we've meant. Possibly. I don't know. Um, on that note, I think we're wrapping up. So, Ro, congratulations, and also congratulations to Sabine and also congratulations to Janice. I love your work. Happy Social Science Week, everyone. Can I just say, in reflecting on the three presentations that, um, that I just listened to, I just think the three of you were absolutely outstanding. I loved every moment of it. I remember when Ro first coined the idea, let's do something on 2020 vision, and I started trying to think about, gee, what would we cover? I had no idea it was going to be this diverse, but it, it has been a real treat to hear this diversity that is existing within Australia and to see clearly through 2020 vision what is going on in the area of playgrounds, palliative care, volunteering and also within homelessness issues and, and to take a moment out of our busy life and wonder about these areas and to think about how can we enhance our Australian community. So congratulations to my fellow presenters. You were wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you have a lovely, lovely rest of the week. Happy, happy, happy. Social Science Week. Thank you, Monica. Oh, can I Thanks, also add two, two thank yous to that? Um, Simone Engdahl and Jen Bond are actually the people who really got this happening. So I'd like to put out a thank you to them. I don't know if they'll hear this or not, but they've been outstanding in pulling us all together across the issue to do something for Social Science Week. So thank you to them as well.
Yes. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Monica, for all your work too. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Monica, and thank you, everyone, for attending and making the time to attend the presentations. Thank you. Here, yeah, here. Yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Wendy. Okay, goodbye, I guess. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone.